Folks, I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast, your weekly magazine show with a lot of fantastic contributors, a lot of cool stuff. Are you ready to go? I am ready. Well, I had a great couple days, I'm assuming, since I'm recording this before them, where I went to L.A. and recorded some with an upcoming show that we'll talk about more as time goes by. So if I saw you in L.A., that was fantastic, but I'm glad to be back, glad to start another week. Dice Tower West is really getting close at this point in time. Looking forward to that, so that's kind of around the corner, and that's pretty exciting. And if you missed it, if you're going to Dice Tower West, I did a video last week telling you about some of the stuff that's going to be there and we can't wait for that other things in the vine if you were a backer of our kickstarter um, then our backer kit is going to be going out very soon if you wanted to back our kickstarter but weren't able to uh, we'll have a link to for you to get involved with that maybe in a week or so uh, dice tower retreat we're going to be announcing that very very shortly watch for a video about that and dice tower cruise our dates for that are almost set in stone so a couple things in the radar really looking forward to all of this um, and i'll also be doing a live q a today at 10 a.m so i'll talk to you guys then but for now, let's find what you might have missed on the internet this week. All right, so not a ton of different things, but a few things. First of all, uh, here's a real brief glance. Uh, take a look at Semi Co op. This is a webcomic, a weekly webcomic. This one's about Arkham Horror movie rights and things like that. I really like this comic. I met the uh, writer and an illustrator, really nice folks. And uh, certainly a comic that I would subscribe to or I'd recommend it. But I thought this week's was interesting. Mike Elliott uh, did an Ask Me Anything on Reddit. Ask Me Anything is always useful, and you can find out good information about them. Uh, the Terror Below, his game on Kickstarter, of course, blowing things up. Uh, and so also he's designed many other games like Thunderstone Quest. No pun included. They announced their game of the year, which was now boarding. I actually thought... Is it a joke? So I went to watch the review, and they really were enamored with this game. Now, on one hand, I completely disagree with them. Um, but, I mean, because I like the game, but to me, nowhere near Game of the Year material. However, I think it's fantastic that such things happen. I like when someone picks a game, and they like it, and then they don't care what other folks think. That's, that's great. And secondly, I think it's great that our hobby has all these different little games that people can pick and say, these are fantastic games. So that's cool. Uh, someone started a thread on Board Game Geek about Vassal's Law versus Quinn's Policy versus Rodney's Rule. Um, Vassal's Law, well, I'll talk about that a little bit later on in the Tom Thinks, but if you want to go see the differences between those, uh, that's there. If you want to see high-resolution pictures of oldest, older finished games, they're on the internet. So I have a link for that in the description. Uh, you can click that and go see. You want to see these older games and look at some nice close-up pictures of them. That's kind of a neat thing. You're like looking at history from time gone by. And finally, John Perkis did a video called Board Games Are Not Just For Geeks Anymore. I thought this was a very impressive video. This is the sort of thing I like. I'm a theater guy anyway. And he broadway this up, had special guests. It's a really well done production. I found it very amusing and, you know, just very high praise I have for this. Anyway, those are the things I found on the internet. Of course, links for all of them in the description below. If you find something interesting and think I should include in this, email me at tom at dicetower.com. What's up, everyone? It's Danny, and welcome to Tabletop Twitter Talk, a segment where I cover some conversations happening between our community of board game and tabletop gamers on Twitter. For this week's poll, I wanted to know about your shelf of shame, aka how many games do you own that you have not played? The four categories I included were zero games, one to four games, five to nine games, or 10 plus games. 619 people answered, and almost 50% said they had 10 plus games that they hadn't played. At 29%, there were one to four games. At 15%, there were five to nine games. And in the minority, 8% of people had zero games that they have owned but not played. Let's see some replies from our Twitter community. For Fiona, she didn't even need to count. The feeling in her heart lets her know it's way more than 10. And same goes for Chris Anderson. 
He was worried that he was going to have to look through his list to get an accurate count, but he's pretty sure that 100 is 10 plus, so that's a safe guess for him. And for Emily, she sees it more as a shelf of opportunity, even if she has too many games on there. And she's looking forward to play Teotihuacan, Coimbra, and Rising Sun. Awesome picks, Emily. Daniel Newman looked at it in a different light, saying that he tracks his in percentages, so if he's below 10% unplayed, he's generally happy. For Kimberly, a lot of her unplayed games are ones that she didn't purchase herself, but she's still trying to make her way through them. And Brad is just down to a couple after a purge, and he's finally playing Abyss. He's also looking forward to play Lewis and Clark. And lastly, Christian Kang from Take Your Chits is just confused on why the word shelf isn't pluralized. So how about you? Are you in the minority that plays all the games that you purchase before you get new ones? Or are you someone that has a lot of games on your shelf of shame or shelf of opportunity? Leave a comment below or reach out to me on Twitter. Remember, I put a poll out every week, so feel free to join the conversation with our amazing board gaming and tabletop community. Thanks for tuning in to Tabletop Twitter Talk. I'll see you guys next week. Hi, everyone. I'm Doug Jr. And I'm Doug III. And we're from Doug and Doug Gaming, and you're watching A, a Fellowship, Fellowship of Meeples. Well, Doug, do you remember what we talked about two weeks ago? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> of course you don't. Well, actually, a couple of episodes ago, we did talk about locations to host your gaming group. Oh, Different places yes. that you could play. And I even asked, <clears throat> uh, before we did that episode, I asked online... Uh, what are some of the places that people play? Yeah. Just to get some ideas. And, of course, the, I think the most popular answer was the friendly local game store. For those that have one available, that yeah. uh, seems to work out the best. But another popular answer was the public library. Okay. Now, I had some questions about that because I guess I'm a little old school. When I think of the library, I think of the old lady behind the counter going, shh, you know, you can't talk, can't make too much noise. And... Um, so I thought, you know, I should contact somebody that's an expert in this. Okay. And there's actually somebody here at the Dice Tower okay. that is an expert on libraries, and that is our own board game librarian, Jen Bartlett. Oh. And I've never met her, never spoke to her, but I contacted her, and she responded back, and we decided to kind of combine our segments today. And so I just asked her, I said, okay, so tell me, what's the deal? How, how would you do gaming at a library? So we're going to show you the segment with Jen Bartlett, the Board Game Librarian. Hey there everyone, it's Jen, the Board Game Librarian, flipping some pages, literally, and pushing some cubes. I'd like to thank Corey from Doug and Doug Gaming for this collaboration this week, and it's on Third Spaces, other places that you can be playing games, and what better place than the library. So I am here now at Manchester Public Library in Connecticut. As a patron, you need to go in with a very specific plan. And the plan has to include things like how many times are you looking to meet? Are you looking to meet once a week, every other week, every three weeks, once a month, every other month? Um, so that's something. And as well, like how big a space are you going to need? Because in libraries, we have various different spaces. We have tables in our reference area. We have tables in our children's area, meeting rooms sometimes, and program rooms. So depending on the number of people you are anticipating that you're going to get, that's kind of how you should start framing it as well. And really having, you know, this is what we're going to be playing. Um, I'd like to have you as a co-sponsor. And, you know, we will provide all the games. We'll bring the games in and the library can help us with the promotion of it. The flyers, the press releases, snacks, even maybe. As, as a service and then you can start building the community from there and besides your own personal gaming group uh, you can also get people from outside uh, so if you have any questions I do highly recommend you reach out to me um, I am on Instagram uh, boardgame.librarian and you can send me a message there and we can connect either via Facebook or phone on my work phone or my work email Hope that solves a couple of questions you might have had, and thanks again, Corey. You know, the library isn't what it used to be. It's true. It's changing with the times. Yeah. So I think it I mean, is... I, I wouldn't know. I haven't been there in a while, but I'll, <laughs> I'll have to check it out now. As, we, you know. we never would have guessed. It's true. You know, it's but, true. 
uh, yeah, the library is a lot different than it used to be, and they've had to adapt. So uh, thank you again for your insight on that. Thank you for watching this episode of A Fellowship of Meeples. Please join us again next time. And until then, I'm Doug Jr. And I'm Doug III. And we'll see you then. Hey everyone, welcome to another Broken Meeple Approved on this Board Game Breakfast show. Today I'm looking at Scythe, the digital edition. I like bears. You can tailor if you want the tracks on or off. Personally, I like to see them there because it's easier to keep track of those than it is to click on this twice to see the various stats in, in the different markers and that. You can move the camera exactly how you feel like, really, so you can move it across or you can use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out. And this is before I've even put free camera angle on. The animations are fairly fluid and you can easily see what's going on, although it can get a little bit slow if you're playing with a lot of players. The interface is actually pretty easy to follow and in a logical sequence. Here I need to build a structure, so I just select one, two, three wood. It then zooms in to ask me which building I want, and when I click on it, it'll ask me where I want it to go. Very straightforward, very easy to follow. When you put fast forward animations on, it really does go fast. Check this out. As you can see, that was pretty speedy and difficult to follow, so if you're a novice, don't activate that mode. But if you know what's going on and you're not too fussed about how the computer takes this turn, just put it on and enjoy some Benny Hill music while you listen to it. Graphically, the game is a bit hit and miss. The board itself looks great. It looks like the original, even with the tracks on it. It's all nice and clean and colourful. Loading up mechs is nice and easy. You get this little bar at the bottom there when you click on a mech, and it allows you to do everything from load in the various meeples, and even the resources. Oh, is my bear hungry? Look at this nice bread. Yes, all bears eat bread. What? Fussy eater. Blue just seems to be having a party up north, and I'm not invited. And Yellow's just having a party as well. Why Why am I never invited to parties? Is it because of my bear? He's just got a giant yak, and you get him in. Now, yesterday I played this, and I won by barely two points. This time I decimated the opponent. So, and this was both on medium difficulty. Don't play this on easy, it's too easy. Medium is alright, though. Hard is a decent enough challenge, but if you really don't want to win all the time, then I say just stick it on hard like most people do. All in all, this is a really solid port for Scythe. You know, the game is still there, all the stuff is... <laughs> All in all, this is an excellent port for Scythe. You can play the base game in any way you want, use all the boards, use all the factions. You know that expansions will come eventually. It looks the part, it feels the part, it's intuitive. Granted, a couple of graphical upgrades couldn't hurt here or there, but otherwise, this is a fine port and definitely worth it if you're a huge fan of Scythe like I am. So, that's it for me. I'll see you on the next Broken Meeple Approved. And for now, enjoy your breakfast. And remember, it's only a game. Take care, guys. So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, Dice Tower Dive, uh, where we go back and take a look at something from years gone by. This time we're taking a look at the Ticket to Ride series. Uh, also, like I mentioned earlier, I'll be doing a live Q&A today. Um, we're gonna, I'll be reviewing several games this week, including Res Arcana and Kapow. That's an interesting one. And of course, Madara, that's the big one I think everyone's interested in. We'll be doing our live Tuesday testing on Tuesday, but also we'll be uh, playing through later on this week Volleyball High and Silver River. Both of these games come into Kickstarter. And then finally, at the end of the week, we'll be taking a look at a back talk of the best sellers of January. So taking a look at those and seeing which games sold the best during that time frame. So lots of different things coming out. We'll see you. Of course, we have live board game breakfast on Thursday, and there are various things uh, that you'll keep. You know, you'll have a chance to see. There won't be any top ten lists this week. I know we can't do one every week. I'm trying to do more than we did last year, so you'll see them almost every week. But we have to prepare for Dice Tower West next week and such. So with all that being said, let's get going. <laughs> Hi, Mike Delisio from Solo Mode Games. I think I've mentioned before that my career is one of a high school teacher, but I don't know if I have mentioned that I'm also somebody that, on a very part-time basis, works at their friendly local game store. I had been a customer there for years, and when the opportunity arose to work a couple of days a month, I 
grab that opportunity because I love the hobby and it's a great excuse to kind of be around people that are interested in something similar than I am and maybe a chance to get new people into this hobby that I love so much. But I've gotten some different insights while working in board gaming retail that I wanted to kind of talk about. One of them is I've noticed that there is maybe, perhaps, an assumption that a retail game is lesser than, not as good as, a Kickstarter version of a game. Now, I understand that to some extent, by its very nature, that might be true. You might get more components in a Kickstarter version of a game, or even upgraded or better components of the, for a Kickstarter version of the game. You may get more content, an exclusive expansion or something along those lines. But is this setting up retailers for kind of a losing deal where the idea of a game being a retail version of a game is lesser than. It has a negative connotation to it when compared to Kickstarter games. I'd love to hear the thoughts of the Dice Tower listeners. Do you feel that retail games inherently have less value than a Kickstarter game because maybe you're not getting those extra components or blinged out components? Or do you prefer to wait for a retail version of a game because you know that maybe the kinks have been worked out and you're not having to front money for something that you're not sure you're what you're going to get? So if you can let me know in the comments below, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks so much for your time and have a great day. Hi, welcome to Board Game Opinions. I'm Steve. I'm Jonathan. I'm Amy. I'm Mark. And this is round four of our speed quiz with a question up for grabs this time. The question this time is Stefan Feld Games. If you look at his Board Game Geek ranking, he's done quite a few. Which are the notable games that come up if you look at his main page on Board Game Geek? Uh, Jonathan is 2-1 up. Jonathan's got two marks, got one Amy hasn't got one yet. So we're going to start with Amy. Um, uh, some questions are worth a point, some are worth two points. And the ones that are worth a point are the ones I own, because we've played a lot of them, so you've probably played those with me. The ones that are worth two points are ones that I have yet to play or own, so you might not have played them a bit, bit harder to get. We're going to start with Amy, see how many you get at home, and then top up the scores at the end. Off you go. Oracle of Delphi. Is there? It's Trajan. a point. Trajan is a point. Aquasphere. Aquasphere is a point. Pass. Merigo. And Merigo is a point. Forum Trajana. Is a point. Uh, in the Year of the Dragon. In the Year of the Dragon is a point. Merlin. Is a point. Notre Dame. Is a point. Um, Castles of Burgundy. Is a point. Castle of Burgundy the card game. Is a point. Oh, uh, no apologies. It's two points because I don't own it. Oh! <laughs> Castle of Burgundy the dice game. It's two points. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, I'll open it up to everyone. Uh, yeah, I, sure. I, have, I think my list is... <laughs> I was enjoying the tennis, so... <laughs> um, they're all named after... Oh, Bora Bora. Bora Bora. I can have oh. yeah, it took you a while. It's a point. Bora Bora. Yeah. Oh, oh. Um, they're all named after places, aren't they? The, 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 the ones on the damn island. <laughs> I know. I think it's the damn island ones. <laughs> uh, uh, I, 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 something. I'm gonna give you that. It's Laisla. Uh, Laisla. Something. Laisla. <laughs> 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 Alright, I'm done. Three, two, yeah. one. We'll call time there. See how you did at home. We'll see how they've done. I think it's between Jonathan and Mark <laughs> on this one. Uh, so and that is actually our first draw. Jonathan and Mark both got seven. They're rapid fire there. I would potentially to give it to Mark because he said Castle and Dubergen need a card game. Jonathan <laughs> sniped him with a dice <laughs> game. Uh, but we're going to call it an actual draw. So Jonathan has two and a half. Mark has one and a half. And Amy's yet to score. Uh, did you miss any at home? So we had you could have had Luna, Jonathan's favourite game for oh, viewing. Yeah. Rialto. <sighs> Carpa Diem is one of his new ones, if you've not got that. Roma, a classic that I haven't actually played yet. And yeah, you can add the Spiekerstadt and Strasbourg as well. There's uh, some other ones too. So well done if you've got any. These guys didn't get home. Give yourself two points. Uh, we've been Board Game <laughs> Opinions. Thanks for watching. Bye. Happy breakfast, everyone. This week, I'm going to follow on from what I was talking about last week about custom inserts. And a few of you actually had your own input. Some actually agreeing with me that the game trays and custom inserts that some games get aren't always beneficial. Now one user, and I'll probably butcher this, but Rick Havoc, I think put it really well and actually made a new point I hadn't thought of. So they said that they have an issue with custom inserts because they don't always allow for sleeved cards. Now that's not something I normally do. That can stop custom inserts being helpful. And I know some people will just ditch normal inserts because of it. Their next point was something I had forgotten, but it's 100% something I agree with. Take Rising Sun as an example. You have trays of figures. You pull them out and they're all gloriously laid out. 
right? I've taken them out, we've played a game, and now I go to put them back, and where do what was it the red race that goes here? Was it the orange or the green? And oh, that kind of fits there, and hopefully games seem to be getting better at this. They seem to be, if they've got some kind of a custom insert, they'll have something in the rules or a special sheet that says, this is where this goes, this is where this goes, but leaving it up to the imagination like Rising Sun does, sometimes it makes things harder than just put them in, in bags or just put them in, in the box, just loose, which completely destroys the importance of any insert, let alone a custom one that's been made by game trays or an equivalent. Um, I just thought I'd touch on those few points because I thought they were really sort of interesting and added to the uh, the conversation about inserts and game tray stuff as a whole. Anyway, enjoy the rest of your breakfast and I'm Oliver East signing out. Okay, so what is getting added to the library this week? We'll start off with the small Power Grid Fabled expansion. I don't know how often people will play this, but I'll stick it in Power Grid. It's very small, easy to add. Then we have Villagers, this game, along with some of the Kickstarter stuff. Uh, fits in here very nicely, and so this one will look good. Uh, Elysium. I knew this was a fun game that a lot of people like, so I wanted to get this one into the library. I don't really care for this game. Stephenson's Rocket, but I know a lot of people do, so that's in the library as well as uh, the one of the expansion maps inside it. Here's a silly game, but fun. Crossfire. I am a big fan of the old Crossfire game. I think that is silly fun. I think that'd be funny to have in the Dice Tower library. Uh, then we have the Feast for Odin expansion, which unfortunately I can't fit into the box, Feast for Odin box itself, so they're going to have to go separately. Uh, then we have Kamisato which is getting added to the library. Uh, again, one I thought was okay, but I think a lot of people will like it, and it certainly is pretty. The Brigade is going to go into the library. Uh, not quite so fast, because I want to mess with the expansion stuff, but it's going into the library. Dice Throne, easy pick here. Dice Throne Season 2. Uh, I'm going to get Season 1 to go along with it. Lanterns, this game was not in our library, surprisingly, but should be, because it's a very, very popular one. I hate diplomacy like I hate it and yet some people love it so that's why it's going to the library and then here's another fun one kind of crossfire style and that is Pucket it's called uh, this game in which you pull these back shoot these this to the middle a lot of fun so this is what's going into the Dice Hour Library this week Hi folks my name is Andy and welcome to Portable Gaming the show about games that are fun to play in pubs and cafes I'm here to talk to you today about a fun little game called Pocket Ops. Now we've all played Noughts and Crosses in England, or Tic-Tac-Toe for my American brethren, and that's kind of what this game is. But don't run away, don't let that fool you, it's a lot more tactical than it seems. So, you start with the standard 3x3, 9 space grid, and your aim is to get 3 pieces in a row. Simple. However, on your turn, what you're going to do when it's your turn to place is choose one of these cards, each one relating to one of those spaces. Once you've played one of those cards, your opponent will have a think, see what they think you're going to do, and play one of their own. When you reveal those cards, so here I've placed H, my opponent has placed G. What happens now, because my opponent didn't guess where I was going, I can place my piece. So I'll place it on that H square. If they had guessed correctly, they'd be able to block me. And that's very fun. I love hidden movement and hidden mechanics. And what makes this more interesting is that you've got these specialist pieces here. So at the beginning of the game, you'll draft two of those. Once you've got those two, they will do different things when they're placed. They may replace one of your pieces with another piece. They may eliminate one of your opponent's pieces. They may slide a piece across. It gives you so much more depth to what could be going on. And you don't know if your opponent's going to play one of those specialist pieces or if they're going to play a normal piece. You don't know if you should waste your specials getting a more interesting play, or if you should just do what you think you need to do. And the game continues. So once you've got your three in a row, you get a diamond. Once you've got your second three in a row, you gain the Doomsday Machine, and you win. This is brilliant. I think it's a lot of fun. I love hidden movement. I didn't know how much I loved it until I started playing games with it. And it is small. Like, this box is tiny. These pieces are nice and hard-wearing. These cards are adorably small. And you can fit this on a very small table. We've played this on small tables, and it fits in a pocket. And I'd highly recommend it. Pocket Ops.
Anyway, thanks for listening, and it's your round. They feel very, like, real life. Stop. Start over. <laughs>
and you look at it and go, but that game goes for hundreds of dollars on eBay. I don't want to buy that. And my answer is, you don't need to. In fact, I don't think anyone needs to go back and play all these classic games. First of all, for each successive generation, that's going to become a more and more impossible task. There's no way you can go back and play all the older games. When it was the year 2000, you could play pretty much every big game that had ever come out and, you could, and you'd be fine. At this point, that's not really possible unless you're doing it full time or retired and have a great people who are going to go with you, you know, a group, and they're like, hey, yeah, we'll do this. But for the most part, you can't play all those older games. And so my quote unquote law is basically there to say, hey, don't worry about it. Don't worry about this fear of missing out. Don't worry about a game that came out in Kickstarter and now is gone. Because if it really was that great of a game, it will be reprinted. They'll do another Kickstarter. Or eventually, a new hot game will come and replace it, and you'll be able to get a copy of the original one for a cheap price. It's just, there's very few games that are out there where you look around and go, you can't get a copy of this anywhere. And it's fantastic. Now, if you really, really want an out-of-print game, and you have the disposable income, pff, who am I to tell you what to do with your money? Buy it. I don't care. And I, again, that's the whole point of this, is it's not meant to be any sort of judgment from on high. I made this or I said this statement as a way to help people who sometimes were being browbeaten by others to say, hey, you should have these games in your collection, why not? And, or to help people who struggle with this fear of missing out as these Kickstarters come out as like, get it now or never get it. Well, that's actually proven to be mostly false. If a game comes out and it's really that popular like Gloomhaven, then there's a second printing or Seventh Continent, there was a second printing. Now, there's still times where they'll say, we're not gonna print this again, but for the most part, if you really want a game, you'll be able to eventually get it. And there are thousands of other games out there. The other reason I said all this stuff is because the fact of the matter is, is if you think a game is fantastic and no one has reprinted it, chances are the demand's very small, it's not as fantastic as you think. But even that's kind of hazy because publishers these days are reprinting everything they can get their hands on. There are lots of what I consider to be fairly mediocre games that are getting reprints or reskinnings that are coming out. And people look at them and go, all right, it's back. Or most people don't even care or notice. And it's so I look back at these older games like, yep, it's probably going to get reprinted. Maybe not this year, maybe next year, but eventually it will happen. Again, I don't look at this as some sort of law. I just call it that because it sounded cool. Um, and um, I'm sure lots of people disagree with me. But I think, I'm going to be honest with you, I think that it's pretty close to being a law. It's pretty close to being accurate most of the time. And I think the last few years have really held this out as we see reprint and reprint of games that are like, what, they're reprinting that? Yeah, because they're going to get around to it eventually. And a lot of these reprints are nicer than the original versions. So, eh, be that as it may, maybe Rodney's Rule or Quinn's, uh, what was that called? Quinn's Colliery? I don't remember what it was. Uh, you know, everyone has these different things. It's fun, but the good news is this, there's always some fantastic games that you can get and play right now. What's up, Internet? My name is Michael Cook. This is Board Game Evangelism, and we're here to spread the good news of face-to-face -face fun. In the last couple of weeks, we took a look at drafting and area control games with the idea of building your game group up to where they wouldn't be overwhelmed by Blood Rage. And today we're going to take a look at the third main mechanic, which is Action Point Allowance System. So the first one that comes to mind for me is going to be the Pandemic and Forbidden games. Any Pandemic, Forbidden, Island, Sky, Desert, those all have a certain number of actions that each player can take on their turn. You can choose between a couple different options, and you're trying to work towards a specific goal. So that, I think, is a great beginning point, a stepping stone into Action Point Allowance System. It's something that's very accessible, simple to grasp with a little bit of just variability and choices. Kind of a next step is going to be, in my opinion, uh, Dead of Winter. That game, you can get more actions as the game goes on. You can get more abilities as the game goes on. So you kind of have a little bit of that buildup that you get in Blood Rage. And it also has a little bit more of a fantasy theme that is a little bit more similar to what you're going to get in Blood Rage. I think another great option is going to be pretty much any worker placement game, because most any worker placement game is essentially an action point allowance game. You can have a certain number of workers, which represent the number of actions that you're going to be taking, and you can place them in all kinds of different places to get different, uh, different actions building towards a specific goal. So I think any worker placement game is going to be a great option as well. So now we've talked about drafting, area control, and action point allowance systems, so that your game group is probably ready to play a game like Blood Rage if you've gone through all these steps. 
If you have an idea of what other game you want to kind of build your game group up to, let me know in the comments section below so we can start working on that one next week. And you can find me at any of the social media outlets at Macronova Games, and enjoy the rest of your breakfast. It's Roy Cande, and this is Printed Pieces. And today we're gonna to talk about the quality that your 3D printer can create. So the quality of 3D printing is really mostly all about time. How much time do you want it to take for your stuff to print out? There's a thing that you can adjust in your slicer called layer height. And if you change it to a much lower layer height, you'll get a lot better quality print, but it'll make the time go up that it takes to print. So the layer height basically chooses how thick the layers are that's building. It can build tiny little layers, which will give you a lot more detail and make it have a lot less of those lines you see on a lot of 3D printings, or you can have it do it faster and you'll be able to have more noticeable lines, but you'll get the prints done way quicker and you can go on to printing the next thing. It's all about choosing how fast you want to print things, how much like infill and different things you want to do can change the time drastically, but it's crazy the quality you can get out of a 3D printer. I got the Ender 3 thinking that, oh, it'd be a lot of fun to um, just mess around with and be able to print out some things. Maybe I'll use it for some like prototype stuff. And then when I actually got it and actually started printing things out, I was actually amazed at the quality you can get. So like, I'll show you a couple pictures of these dragons that I printed out. Um, these are from a Kickstarter called the Lost Dragons from 3D Printed Tabletop. It's actually one of the main reasons that I got into 3D printing in general. So definitely make sure to check his stuff out. He has all sorts of amazing tips, but the, the quality that you can get out of a 3D printer is almost on par with a lot of other board game miniatures that you'd see in games. Um, it's not exactly 100%, um, but if you put it on the table in front of you and set it out, and especially if you end up painting it up, like it can look ridiculous. And it's amazing what you can do out of just like a thin wire of plastic going through a 3D printer and printing it out if you have a really good STL file. And you can always just change your quality settings and make a lot of your prints just look a lot better if you're willing to take the time to make it happen. Well, thanks so much for joining me on Printed Pieces. I hope you've enjoyed this segment. Let me know in the comments down below what you've been 3D printing, if you have a 3D printer, or what you'd love to see 3D printed. So on the next print pieces, I'll see you then. Hey folks, this is Jonathan for Harsh Opinion and today we're gonna to talk about lock-in games. Do you like having lock inside games? And if so, at one point, at which point does lock it's too much for you? For my part, I don't like lock-in games. I, I prefer winning a game because I played better than my opponents. I don't, I, I don't, I don't like winning a game because I was luckier. For sure, most of the games has some lock involved at some degrees. Let's say in most games like Pillars of the Air, you have an event card that you're gonna flip at the start of each round, and that event card's gonna that event card's gonna dictate to you uh, some rules for the round, and that's it. Or some deck building games where you that's for sure that's the drug of the law, but at least you're the one who's gonna build that deck, so you know. You're gonna you're gonna build your own probability to uh, draw such cards and things like that. And there's games like let's say Marco Polo, um, Castle of Burgundy, Bora Bora that involve dice, and you're gonna roll those dice to do actions with them. And such number is gonna give you such type of actions, or the better the numbers are, the better the actions, but most of those games have ways to manipulate the dice to get the number you want, at least. And so at one point, it's still luck involved, but you can manipulate that luck to your own benefit. And there's games like Death Sense and Dungeon Crawlers in general, where you're gonna roll dice to get do skill tests or to fight monsters. And sometimes bad roll is bad roll, but most of the time you get equipment cards or spell cards and things like that that's gonna boost your own dice rolls or give you better dice, so it's a way to mitigate luck. But there's some games that even if the luck is not the old game, there's no way to mitigate luck. And it's an important part of the game, and those kind of games I tend to not like. There are still exceptions to the rule, but most of them I don't like. An exception to the rule will be Ticket to Ride. I don't like the game as much as I used to because I'm, I'm 
I'm now playing games more involving than that, but I found it weird that one third, if not more, of your points come from objective cards that are gonna go three blind object objective cards, and you're gonna keep a one, two, or three of those cards, and that's gonna give you those points at the end of the game, or you're gonna lose those points if you're not able to complete them. And if I'm lucky enough, I'm gonna draw cards that are already completed, so that's gonna win me the game. And my opponent's gonna draw some cards, and is nowhere to uh, near completed at least one of those, and you still have to keep one cards, and is gonna lose point at the end of the game. That's gonna swing the games in such ways that. There's no nothing you can do. Mo the, the the a third of the game it's plain luck, and this I don't like. So, do you like luck in your games? Leave a comments in the section below, and I'm gonna try to answer them all. Thank you for watching. See you next time, guys. Bye bye. Hey guys, welcome back. This is Nick for your Mental Health Minute. It's getting cold outside. Yeah, there's a lot of snow out there, especially for us East Coasters who are really dealing with that. And some of us might have what's called Seasonal Affectiveness Disorder, which is a time that during the winter and the fall, when it starts getting darker earlier, we start getting more sad or more depressed, if you have such a thing. Because there's less light. There's less light, there's less going on. So I find that board games is a perfect way to combat such a feeling. If you're feeling something of this nature, my suggestion for you to be play a co-op game. Play a co-op game with some people and really try to bring your spirits up. More people, the better. Play games like The Resistance, Avalon, things of that nature, or even something as far as Mechs vs. Minions or something of that nature just to get your spirits up. And the best way to do this would be start playing the game when it's light out around 3 o'clock and then it's going into darkness. That way, you don't see or pay attention to the inevitable lowering of the temperature and the inevitable light going down. You're too engaged in the experience you're having. And that way, you get a little bit more distracted and it's a little less difficult for you. Um, and then it's a nice easy transition in from the light to the dark and you can move on with the rest of the night. And it's not so sudden and coming down on you. It's not as Im impactful. Everyone has a game that makes them happy. Everyone has a game that they really enjoy playing with others that bring up their smile and less their competitive spirit. What's your game that makes you really happy and can bring you from a down mood back to an up mood? Let me know in the comments below. I would love to hear it. Once again, this is Nick, and this is your Mental Health Minute. Follow me on Twitter for updates, and do enjoy your breakfast. Welcome to the Tantrum Mouse After Party. We just played Cryptid from Osprey Games. We'll talk about what we loved, what we hated, who won, and how. So Cryptid is a two to five player deduction game. In our game, we were looking for a Sasquatch. Uh, Melissa, what did you like about the game? Well, I do love deduction and trying to figure out what the other players' clues are because I know a little piece of the information, but not everything. So kind of figuring out based on where players are putting their cubes and their discs, what I think their clue might be. I like the word cryptozoologist. I mean, <laughs> this is a pretty cool word, uh, cryptid. I love the box cover. But I will say one thing I didn't like as much is the inside. Um, the, the artwork is just okay for me. Um, they're just cubes and, and just the circles and, the, and things like that. I think it works very well for the game and I think probably, I don't know how I would increase it. So, I mean, there's that. <laughs> okay. While I did like the deduction aspect of it, yeah. I felt it lent heavily into my analysis paralysis. Okay. I just felt rushed because I, I couldn't like lay out what I needed to deduce in my mind. And then there wasn't enough cubes. Like, oh yeah, I, I felt like I couldn't ask you any more questions. To yeah. Like Ryan, to ask Melissa questions. Yeah. Yeah, I was down to my last cube, I used it, but then before I got back to my turn, I got enough information from everyone else that I was able to find Sasquatch, even though I had rung out of cubes. Yeah, the people are comparing this maybe a little bit to Treasure Island, um, another deduction type game that's pretty new. So in the comments below, tell us which one you liked, Treasure Island or Cryptid uh, from Osprey, Gra Osprey Games. Um, thanks for joining us on this Tantrum House after party, and we look forward to seeing you again.
everyone, my name is Annette, and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Applied Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game of Tudor. So this is a worker placement along with a set collection game. However, this also has an odd component, which are these hand shields. So let me show you a little bit about this game and why I really like it. Players will want to go into any one of these three chambers. They will do so by placing a courtier outside of it on a chair waiting to be seated. In the second phase, players will then place their courtiers inside the chambers by placing them in the upper left part of the chamber room on these specific chairs. In future turns, they might even bump out someone. In the third phase, players will place their lords into one of the three chambers. In the fourth phase, this is where all the action happens because the courtiers will discuss with their lords what certain actions they will take in order to move up in the royal court. A courtier can do one of the two actions that's on the table as long as there's a lord present. The lord can also take an action in that chamber and they can in fact take both of the actions. For example, in action A, you have to show that you have certain rings in order to move up. In this case, a player has both the red and the green ring shown on their player hand. And by having those rings, they can move their courtiers up as long as those tokens match those rings. You'll also be able to complete bonus actions depending on where the rings are located on your player hand. Players will score points throughout the game if they eventually do reach the throne room. Throughout the game, players will be collecting tokens and cards, and anything left over will score them extra points. Whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins. The first thing that stands out in this game is, of course, these hands. Not only are they a pretty odd thing to have on the table, but they are functional as well. Not only do they hold the rings, but they also function as bonus actions that you collect throughout the game. So you're trying to kind of synergize the actions you're taking on the board with the placement of the rings you have in hand. You're also collecting cards and trying to match the rings in order to push your figures forward to gain those major points. And that's why I really like Tudor. Well, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye! And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast, folks. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you again for coming in. If you're missing out on our live stuff that we're doing each week, come in and check it. There's a great chat there going back and forth. We're working hard at, in our live chats to be more communicative with you. You can go back and look at our Board Game Breakfast that we did last Thursday. That's kind of the, the trend that I'm trying to move to, us going back and forth with you. And I hope that you enjoy that as time goes by. And uh, we're trying to keep these on a regular schedule. Now, that schedule is going to be disrupted as time comes by and there are different conventions that we go to there's going to be disruptions in our live stuff but I hope that you can see that and from just me posting things in the past I try to be extremely punctual on how I get things out there and we will attempt to do that with our live stuff as time goes by Either way, thanks for coming to another Board Game Breakfast. Thanks to all my fantastic contributors who do a fantastic job. And many of them have their own channels. Go check out their channels and see if you want to see more of them. I'll see you all next time. I appreciate you all. Tom Vassell signing out.